Well, we're here for a lot of reasons today. I guess the big reason you can see behind me, I've got my book, A Bartender's Guide to the World, which just launched. My publication date was October 25th. Uh, so just about three weeks ago, and it's gone uh, into global uh, printing and publication. So it's very exciting. And I'm happy to be here today chatting all things about my book. It's been great. I think, uh, you know, love it or hate it. Amazon has helped make the, make the book go global. So I, I've had uh, friends in say Dubai, Saudi Arabia, Spain, uh, different parts of the world that send me messages saying, how can I get the book? And I said, it's actually available on Amazon because you have a local Amazon. So that it's, it's been great in that regard in terms of accessibility. Uh, being that I worked with a Canadian publisher, I am delighted and extremely surprised how quickly it's it's gone around the world. And it's, you know, half of this book was also on the chopping room floor. So I'm very excited about seeding perhaps a volume two in the future. <laughs> well, I think everyone deep down probably has the inspiration to write a book at some point. It's, it's one of these moments of if I were to write a book, what would I write it about? And I think since I've been working in the bar industry and been traveling, visiting bartenders and folks in different parts of the world, 60 different countries to be exact, it's been a, a really incredible moment for me on a personal level to be able to journal. I've, I've always been a writer. I've always uh, captured, I, I suppose, memoirs of places that I've visited, interesting things that I've tasted, people I've encountered, because I don't know how long I'm going to have this my long and short term memory for. So I like to be able to capture things and share them with others. And that became the basis for what I would hope would be, uh, what I hoped would be a book pitch. And this was several years ago. I mean, this was, was over 10 years ago that I started journaling about my experiences. And when it came time to be in a position with my, my co-author, James Fraioli, to pitch a publisher, uh, A Bartender's Guide to the World wasn't named at the time, but it really was my guide to the world on how I viewed visiting different places, interacting with different bartenders, engaging with the way bartenders and chefs work with flavors to create new and exciting drinks and sort of the stories that bring them to life. And so while the, the recipes themselves, yes, if you want to call it a, a bit of a recipe book, you can, but the recipes are the illustrations that bring the stories to life. The head notes are not small head notes that uh, are, you know, for example, this is my spin on an old fashioned because I love hibiscus. It's more of an essay talking about the, the place that I visited where hibiscus was the main attraction and who are the bartenders that were, were bringing this, this interesting ingredient and also the sense of place to life and what was the inspiration behind the cocktail that I would create for someone at home to be reading this book and follow along and of course make the drink. So I'm, you know, I, I think we're, we're, for me, I'm in a really great position now because the evolution of where I started, you know, 10 years ago, journaling about these experiences, but chronicling across 22 years in the industry has been uh, cathartic in a lot of ways. And it's also allowed me to write, I think, very honestly about our times during the pandemic as well, because I was writing this during the pandemic when our industry was in a, a really difficult uh, position. So the the stories feel even more honest than sensationalized, if that makes sense. It feels uh, as though I'm really telling the stories and really highlighting the people that make our industry special and why bartenders are special. So in the end, I'm, I'm very happy with uh, with what we came to to publish in A Bartender's Guide to the World. Maybe one of the most challenging parts of maybe writing a book also from the author perspective and also from the publisher perspective is how do we position a book to be relevant in the landscape of books available, of authors and also titles available uh, and subjects available. But then how do we also make it relevant when you're writing it three years before it actually comes to publication date? So I think with all of these things in mind, um, the way the way that we position the the I guess the abstract of the book being that it was about, you know, 75 places highlighted through 75 stories and cocktails to illustrate is something that we haven't really seen uh, recently in the bartending world. It also highlights a different set of talents and skills 
that uh, bartenders should be honing. And a lot of bartenders already have and, and people in the industry sort of capturing, uh, you know, these really special moments in their in their lives and, and learning how to really uh, capture those in, in stories. So much of our industry is about storytelling. And I think being able to create a, a cocktail book that has you know, really incredible recipes inside. I mean, there's a whole section just dedicated to zero proof and non-alcoholic drinks. Uh, there's an entire section of mise en place recipes on on helping bartenders and uh, home bartenders to make non-alcoholic vermouths at home, which you don't really don't see in any books. So I think there was there was a way to capture my signature style as a bartender, but then also to bring something new that would be important on the shelf of, of bar books that uh, both home and professional bartenders would reach for and say, you know, this book is one of a kind because it has X, Y, Z inside. And I know that I can lean on this when I'm developing recipes or creating stories or what have you for the future. So uh, not to uh, coin it as maybe feeling like a bit of a timeless book, but um, I think when you've been bartending for over 20 years, it does feel a bit timeless in a way. And I think the recipes inside uh, from mise en place to actual cocktail recipes feel a bit timeless in terms of my career. And I hope that the the readers picking up the book will feel the same way. The book is divided up uh, quite classically in, in the, the front pages um, in terms of this is how you set up your bar. These are the spirits that you should have on your home bar cart or on your shelf. Uh, these are some of the indispensable tools of building your home bar from glassware to bar tools um, to indispensable, uh, you know, products, for example. Uh, following that, there's um, a top 10 list of unique and strange ingredients that appear in this book that uh, people should dive into in, in, uh, in a bigger way because they do show up in recipes. And that would include ingredients like uh, choosing interesting raw honeys from different types of flowers to experiment with different sweeteners. Uh, to using fresh flowers in drinks. Of course, we feature uh, my bitters company, Bitter Sling Bitters, on that list as well. And then other things, like I'm totally obsessed with coconut, so there's coconut condensed milk as well. So in that top 10 list, it's some new and interesting ingredients that we're hoping uh, the professional and home bartenders pick up when they see them in the store and say, oh my God, I would love to work this into, into the drinks from Lauren's book. And then the rest of the book is is broken down by spirit category. So agave spirits would be first, which would encapsulate uh, agave spirits like tequila and mezcal. Uh, then we move uh, alphabetically through the different types of spirits from vodka to rum and sugar cane spirits. There are sections on uh, wines. So that would be table wines, aromatized wines, vermouth, cherries, uh, sakes, etc. Uh, an entire section on zero proof. And actually, a, a really great feature in the book as well. In I, I have I handily have the book in front of me as well as like ten behind me, so I can pull this out and show you. But there's um, in each recipe on the top right corner of the actual recipe page, there is a small emblem that identifies what the proof is. And that is a small hydrometer, which is what we use to measure the volume of alcohol, generally in uh, large volumes of liquid. And so where the red dot appears on the hydrometer identifies the level of proof or alcohol level in the drink, which is sort of a cute way to do it instead of identifying the, the number of grams of alcohol in a serving. So for example, the page that I just showed you, which is the bitter brain freeze, <laughs> which is a really, really cool drink. It's essentially an ice cream float. Um, it uh, identifies it as uh, medium proof or mid proof, which is great for folks as they're looking through the book and perhaps looking for alternatives to uh, full strength drinks. So we identify standard proof, mid proof, low proof, and also zero proof uh, through a wide range of drinks. And you can see there, Seven Mile Mule is a low proof drink. Um, so I think that's a, a really nice feature of the book. And then at the end of each chapter on each, uh, so for example, that is the wine chapter. So at the end of that chapter, we'll have all of the sub recipes or the mise en place required to make the drinks from uh, the uh, preceding chapter of recipes. And, you know, I, I think there's a lot of twists and turns that one can take with uh, the different mise en place recipes, encouraging 
you know, folks to really mix and match some of the ingredients. If you fall in love with something like the bitter brain freeze, for example, you know, you can follow the recipe, uh, you know, verbatim or to the nth degree where you're using exactly to spec, you know, the type of ice cream and the type of bitters and the type of uh, spirits or the type of ingredients. But as you become more and more comfortable, the the whole idea with the book is a choose your own adventure of learning the drinks, falling in love with them in the way that I have, but then also you know, experimenting in your own way of if you have a different type of ice cream on hand, maybe use that instead. So I think that there's there's lots of different opportunities. And because the, the recipes, uh, they, they, they're not, I mean, not every recipe in the book is complex, in the sense that you need so many different ingredients to bring it to life. But not all the recipes are simple, either. So this this does take some effort on the part of the bartender. And uh, preparation is key. So just like picking up your favorite cookbook and cooking to the recipe, uh, this cocktail book follows that same type of pattern because, of course, it was developed by a chef and bartender together. And so um, we just uh, are really excited to hear the feedback and what some of the favorite drinks drinks are in the book. But one I guess I would I would love to highlight, which is on the more simpler side, this is called The Family Affair, which is inspired by uh, by the Barmejo family. Uh, so Julio Barmejo, who is, uh, him and his family have owned Tommy's Mexican restaurant in San Francisco for over 55 years. And this drink is inspired by uh, Tommy's margarita, um, using, uh, Blanco tequila as the base basil cordial, which is quite easy to make. All you need is a blender, water, uh, sugar and basil with some, uh, either some lime juice or, uh, some citric acid with uh, bitter sling moon dog Latin bitters and sliced jalapeno peppers and a bit of salt. So I mean, you can see that even the the simplest recipes in the book are still incredibly complex in their build and also their flavor profile. But the story that goes along with it while you're sipping is what really brings the experience to life. For example, when I just uh, shared about uh, Julio Bermejo, his you know, his his family is sort of like the basis for the inspiration of how, how we've come to drink the Tommy's Margarita now worldwide as one of the most popular, you know, nouveau classic drinks of all time. And so, you know, just putting a Tommy's Margarita in the book is maybe it's great for a home bartender, but doesn't really do anything to highlight um, my skill set as a bartender and showing the evolution of where we can take uh, classic style drinks. And so each one of the recipes, uh, you know, just show you again here. So we've got the serving size, we have the area of inspiration, so the place, and we've got the inspired by which classic drink as part of the recipe design. And that is an important uh, feature that we're starting to see on menus and something that I've been putting on menus uh, for the last 15 years, inspired by X classic cocktail, because it helps the consumer sitting and reading the menu, or it helps the person at home reading the book and the recipe guide to understand a little bit more of the familiarity about the individual drink that they're about to embark on to order or to make at home. And so uh, while the stories are definitely inspired by the people, the places and the things that I've encountered, the recipes as the original creations that I've made do lean into uh, a lot of the inspiration I take from those exact stories in those exact places. Another great uh, example from the book would be the the Miraflores Chicha Morada. Chicha Morada being the purple corn based either alcoholic or non-alcoholic drink that uh, originates in Peru. And my friend uh, Joel from Peru was uh, kind enough to share some of the recipe ideas that have been in his family, uh, specifically from his grandmother for years. And while highlighting and paying credit to his grandmother and to Joelle in the book, in that specific recipe entry, the recipe itself is still an evolution of where I took the Miraflores Chicha Morada based on a recipe that uh, had been in his family for years. So there is a uh, credit paid uh, across to all the folks that have inspired all the elements of the recipes and how they're brought to life. Well, I'll, I'll share with you how my mother just read the book. <laughs> So my mom, she's got a full bar kit at home. She loves to make drinks, uh, but she is uh, a, a very typical, you know, home bartender slash, uh, you know, book collector. She loves to read. So for her, she's already read this cover to cover and read through the stories, really just imagine brought to life with the photos. And I think you approach it in the same way that you do with uh, your favorite cookbook. 
There are ways that, you know, that the, the photography in a cookbook brings to life, you know, these beautiful recipes as a, as a way of inspiring what you might make for dinner that night or what you might make for guests as they come over. And so I think, you know, it is a choose your own adventure in that way. But I think the way, to be honest, I think my mom has identified the best case scenario. I think reading through because the stories are really captivating. Uh, they're very interesting ways of describing cocktails, of describing places that inspire us with our taste memory. And then I think going through and, and sort of highlighting on specific pages, the, you know, the recipes that really speak to you, the styles of drinks that seem to be things that you'd be quite interested in making. And then just going through one by one and deciding, you know, how to bring that to life, uh, maybe with occasions. If you have friends coming over, you'd love to serve a new style of aperitif. The holidays are coming. And maybe if you're, you know, gifting someone this book, of course, uh, but even if you have the book in your possession, you've got friends coming over, you'd like to highlight maybe a more, you know, winter style uh, aperitivo for, 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 those, uh, for those folks coming over. I think it's, uh, it's, you can choose this. Uh, to use this tool as you like. And of course, want everyone to make the drinks in the book, but equally the the photography and, and how it's brought to life is is just really captivating. So even just having it close by for folks to just pick up and flick through uh, and having some aha moments. Oh, I didn't realize you could do that with this ingredient or wow, that's a really beautiful drink. I'd love to learn more. Um, or that is a really strange name for a drink. I wonder how she came up with that. Um, I, I just think it's, uh, you know, there are multiple ways uh, that you can that you can utilize this book. And I think there are no wrong answers here. Anyone can use this book. You know, there are some recommendations of specific tools that one would use in order to make some of the ingredients. But uh, it's there are several ing I would say at least half of the recipes in this book require uh require no specialty equipment other than the bar tools that you have and perhaps, you know, making a syrup with, uh, you know, a, a pot on the stove with some water, some sugar and whatever the ingredients are. Um, so this is aimed at whatever, whatever level we are at as home bartenders, especially post pandemic, where discerning consumers that would pop into uh, bars and restaurants around the world and discover interesting and delightful drinks on a menu, and then they'd be inspired to go home and make those exact drinks while they have the ingredients available. So I think that while this book is appropriate for everyone from a storybook, photos, you know, like look at half the cookbooks on the shelf behind me and cocktail books, uh, but it can be utilized as well as a, a guidebook for making great drinks at home. And while it does feel a bit intermediate, uh, I think both novice and expert, and as well, folks in the industry that are, are professional bartenders that are looking to create new styles of vermouths or different types of ingredients, inspiration for writing or creating different types of uh, storytelling for their cocktail menus. I think this does um, answer a, a, a lot of different areas. So I think it is appropriate for everybody, if I'm honest. It's really hard to say what my favorite drink is, but I would say that, you know, some of the first ones that I created and it was, you know, obviously prior to the pandemic, uh, a lot of these stories and, and recipes had been had been written already. Uh, the stories, you know, were inspired by a very different world that we were living in prior to 2020. And so I I loved going back and re-reviewing those stories and those recipes and and deciding the right way to bring them to life, knowing that this book would come out and we might very well have had still been in the pandemic. And so I think a lot of the my favorites in the book are the ones that really highlight uh, the people that have been part of, you know, helping to curate the type of person that I've become. And I think it's important that we are highlighting, uh, you know, the, the the people that have been part of uh, creating our, our fondest memories. And so there are some, there are quite a few recipes in the book that are inspired by my family. And it's rather than saying, Oh, we went to this place and we had this drink. Wasn't it great? It's in the book, but it's, it's highlighting, you know, a trip that I, uh, I'll, I'll use this one as a, uh, as an example the liberation cocktail, which highlights my grandparents were, you know, three of my four grandparents were, uh, were, were part of world war II. My my grandmother Florence, she was uh, one of the first female operators for Morse code for the Royal Air Force. 
uh, during World War II. My grandfather, Mac, was part of the Royal Canadian Air Force, and he was overseas, uh, you know, fighting on behalf of uh, Canada. And then my, my other grandfather, Brian, was based in the Land Army in, in the Midlands in England, uh, just outside Manchester, and was a mechanic working on artillery. And then my other grandmother, she was based at home in Toronto, sort of managing on the home front, as so many, you know, women and families did during during those conflicts. And so, you know, th- that story is has been something that has been part of my uh, my my memories forever. And I was just trying to f- figure out the right way to bring it to life. And then I found myself on a trip to France, and I was in northern France in the Champagne region, specifically in a small town in between Rheims and Epernay, which are the two cities that uh, are the Champagne region. And I, at every corner I turn, there was a, a bridge or a wall or a, a building or a house that had a plaque on the side that it was liberated on whatever date it was from whatever occupation by you know, this military unit. And so many of these areas were uh, liberated by the Canadians or liberated by the British. And I just thought, what an amazing moment. And I stood there and was just in the moment and, you know, tears rolling down my face. And of course, it was just Veterans Day a couple couple days ago. And I go through the same thing every year, just really highlighting and paying homage to, you know, the, the families that are still going through conflicts like this and uh, where I uh, ha- have been really proud uh, to share their story and encap- encapsulate it in, you know, a book that will live on long after I'm gone. And, you know, the liberation drink is a spin on a white Negroni and the ingredients themselves are not, you know, terribly complicated. It's quite a simple drink to make, but it's the story that brings it to life. And, you know, I've got I I also collect antiques, uh, wartime antiques. So that war map of Europe on the bottom there as part of the prop in the photo. Uh, This was from 1938. I've got my grandfather's canteen uh, that, that, you know, was from the 1950s. And it's just a really. It's just a really interesting way of bringing to life a story that is so incredibly important with a very, very simple drink. So that's one of my favorites. I would say this book should inspire the reader to delve a little bit deeper into the creative brain of a bartender and to spend a little bit of extra time chatting to bartenders and folks in bars and restaurants about their lives and about the different things that they've seen, some of the places they've been, some of the great cocktails they've made and make sure to really, you know, spend time uh, celebrating the things that, you know, bars and restaurants are putting together for for the guests to enjoy. And from there, it's, you know, make more drinks at home. So you've created these wonderful relationships with, uh, with bartenders. Now you go home and make the drinks and then celebrate back again with the bartenders on what you've created at home and continue that cycle on. I think this is a great opportunity to merge our two worlds together in more of an equalized uh, moment in hospitality rather than, um, you know, us serving the guest and the guest may or may not tip. I think this is a, not to be punny about it, but I think this is a tipping point in our industry where um, we can really highlight uh, the skill set and the talents that people in our industry have and that we really are equalized to, you know, the rest of the world. And we do deserve uh, a voice and we deserve to be celebrated and please don't forget to tip your bartender and support local bars and restaurants. I think uh, I, I would love to hear more of, uh, of what people think about the book and how they're jumping in and making some of the recipes. Uh, I, would, I would love it if there's you know, commentary on, on this podcast or if there's a, a way that you know, folks could share on Instagram, uh, at Lauren Moat, would love to, to hear in DMs or stories, just anything at all, would just uh, love to, to keep in touch and hear how people are, are getting along. And I look forward to uh, spending more time, uh, you know, myself just revisiting a lot of these recipes and stories. I, I do have a text in my bed and I read it every day. So it's, uh, it's, it's a great uh, achievement for me, uh, definitely a milestone in my life and my career. And uh, I look forward to, um, to hearing everybody's thoughts. Thank you.